Hey guys, welcome back. And something that I want to talk about today is something that I own and that I just think is cool. And you know, it's something that I picked up a little while back. And um, it is none other than this book that sits before me, which is a translation of the Bible, Old and New Testaments, uh, and also the Apocrypha. We'll talk about that into the language Esperanto. Now, if you don't know what Esperanto is, then I'll give you a little primer here in just a few moments. Uh, if you do know what Esperanto is, then there's a chance that you found this video because you speak Esperanto. And if that's the case, then saluton kai bonvenen al mia canalo. Um, but this is an English language video, so we're just going to be speaking the King's English here and going to move forward with that. Uh, but yeah, I want to talk about the Esperanto translation of the Bible. Now, for those who don't know what Esperanto is, Esperanto is a language that was created from scratch by a man named L.L. Zamenhof around the turn of the 20, uh, 20th century. So we're talking right around 1900. Um, he created this language. Uh, he lived in what is today Poland, and at the time it was the Russian Empire. And uh, his goal here was to create a language that would facilitate world peace, okay? So pretty lofty, idealistic goal, but at least as far as I understand the story, uh, what happened was that he lived in a neighborhood that was multi-ethnic and in which a lot of different languages were spoken. I, I believe that I read that somewhere in the neighborhood of five languages were actively being spoken just in this one area. And no one could speak the, one group couldn't speak the other's language and vice versa. And so the situation was that there was a lot of hostility and suspicion among, among the groups because they couldn't communicate with each other. So he came up with this idea to create a language that could be as easy as possible to learn. They would have a regular grammar instead of an irregular grammar like natural, national languages do. Uh, with a lot of exceptions to rules and idiomatic expressions and whatnot. And, uh, and then people would learn this language and then everybody around the world would be able to communicate. Now to be clear, his goal was not to uh, kill off national languages. Uh, in fact, Esperanto is what's known as an auxiliary language. Uh, it's designed to be a secondary language specifically for international communication. So the idea here is that when you're at home in your own nation with your own countrymen, then you'll speak your national language. But when you're trying to communicate with somebody halfway around the world who doesn't know your language, you would use Esperanto. Obviously, uh, Esperanto has not taken the world by storm and become the global language like he hoped that it would, um, but it is still an active language and people all around the world speak it. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s, it had a, a real heyday then it kind of died down a little bit, but there was still a community of speakers um, up until the point when the internet came around. And the internet has really revived language and given it new life and brought in a lot of, a lot of new speakers because suddenly the internet allowed Esperantists from all around the world to come together and to find each other and to communicate and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, today, uh, it's unknown how many speakers the language has. I've seen estimates everywhere from 100,000 people to 2 million people. Nobody really knows. But there are people all around the world that speak it. On the internet, you can find subreddits and Facebook groups and Telegram channels and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and every year, there's also a World Congress in which, uh, you know, somewhere in the world will host the Congress and then people will come from around the world to attend it. So it's very much a living language. Um, there are a lot of people who speak it or at least have some knowledge of it. And uh, it's just fun. You know, it's fun to be part of the community. And also the language itself, because of its regularity and its logical structure, its purely logical structure, uh, it just makes it just a really fascinating thing to study and to try to learn. Plus, because it is, I wouldn't call it easy, but relatively easy compared to national languages with all their irregularities and you know other various assorted nonsense. Uh, it's definitely easy compared to trying to learn Spanish, which I can personally attest to because I tried to learn Spanish. Um, I got bogged down in all the irregular verbs and the 16 different tenses and conjugations and whatnot. And so uh, 
if you do struggle, if you, if you want to be bilingual and learn another language, but you've struggled learning a, a natural language, uh, such as Spanish or Russian or Japanese or what have you, maybe consider giving Esperanto a, a chance. And, uh, you know, I will link some things down in the description uh, to where you can find more information about what the language is and how to learn it and so on and so forth. So if it sounds intriguing to you, definitely check that out. Uh, but today, uh, we're going to talk about the Esperanto Bible, a little bit about how it came to be, some of its features, and we'll take a look at an actual Esperanto Bible. That part, frankly, may be a little bit anticlimactic just because it's a very, this is a very plain object. Um, it's not ornate in any way. Um, there's no study notes or anything like that. It's just the text. But we'll give it a look. But before we want to do that, um, let's learn a little bit about the history behind the translation. In order to do that, I have an article here, Wikipedia article, titled simply, Bible Translations into Esperanto. Now, there's not a lot of information that I've been able to find on the history of the Esperanto Bible. I found a little bit, but not much. So if there's anybody watching this video or that you know, knows where to find more information, definitely hop into, co into the comments and uh, let us know because I am really curious to, to learn more about the history behind the translation and just to understand how it originated. Now, we're going to go through this article here, or at least some of it. Uh, it's not very long, and obviously I cannot attest to the accuracy. There's not a lot of sourcing to the article, so all I can tell you is that the article exists, and I can tell you what it says. But according to this, uh, it says, a committee led by British clergy and scholars. This is for the New Testament. A committee led by British clergy and scholars, J.C. Rust, B.J. Beveridge, and C.G. Wilkinson. I have no idea who those men are, beyond the fact that apparently they existed, they knew Esperanto, and they worked on translating the New Testament. But apparently they came together into a committee to translate the New Testament and to review L.L. Zamenhof's translation of the Hebrew Bible for eventual publication by the British and Foreign Bible Society. Uh, it says the New Testament was completed in 1910 and published in 1912. And um, now the Old Testament. The Old Testament was translated by L. L. Zamenhof himself, so by the creator of the language, who was Jewish. He translated the Old Testament. Okay, so it says Zamenhof translated the entire Masoretic Bible that's the Old Testament, into Esperanto, completing the work in March 1915. Okay, so by 1910, the New Testament was done. It was published in 1912. According to this, 1915, the Old Testament was done by Zamenhof himself. Now, as far as the sourcing, I, the New Testament, from what, everything that I understand, was translated directly from the Greek. Okay? Old Testament... A little more complicated. My understanding, based upon one thing that I read, is that perhaps Zamenhof's understanding of Hebrew wasn't super great. I don't know that that's the case. Maybe what I read is inaccurate. I do know that he knew Hebrew, but I understand that maybe it was somewhat, his knowledge was somewhat limited. But here's what this says. According to Arya Benguni, I hope I pronounced that correctly. In preparing his Esperanto version, Zamenhof appears to have relied primarily on the 1783 German Pentateuch translation and commentary by Moses Mendelssohn. And then it gives a name here, which I will not attempt to pronounce. Okay, so a 1783 German Pentateuch translation, let's remember that the Pentateuch is the same as the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Here's a curious note, though. It says, this German Pentateuch translation, in which the German was written in Hebrew characters. I don't know what that means. I really don't. I don't know if that means that maybe it was written phonetically in Hebrew characters, in the same way that, uh, I can't remember what the name of it is, but there's a Japanese system of writing that uses the Latin alphabet 
to phonetically express Japanese words. Maybe it's something like that. I'm not sure. I actually tried to do a little bit more research on this particular translation to understand a little bit more about what that is. Could not find a lot of information. What I did find kind of described it in the same way. A German translation written in Hebrew characters. If anybody knows what that is, comment. Let us know. Okay. Now, but remember that's the Pentateuch. So that's only the first five books of the Bible. Or, you know, we have 34 more in the Old Testament. Now for that, it says, in addition to the 1783 German Pentateuch translation, that it seems that he also relied on the Russian Synodal Bible, a work characterized by considerable archaic vocabulary and the use of grammar, which is essentially that of Old Church Slavonic. So an old Russian translation. So it does not seem that Zamenhof purely relied upon if he relied upon it at all, the Masoretic text, which is the, the actual Hebrew text that undergirds essentially every Bible translation. Okay. Today we also have found the Dead Sea Scrolls that has influenced things somewhat, but the Masoretic text has always been the foundation of pretty much any Bible translation if it was translated from Hebrew. Sounds like maybe the Old Testament is kind of a translation from a translation. New Testament from the Greek. Now, we're going to talk about the Londona Biblio, the London Bible. I'm pretty much just going to read this straight. Oh, actually, hold on, let me go back here. Because there's an interesting little historical tidbit. This I am I'm going to read straight. It says, Zamenhof translated the entire Masoretic Bible into the Esperanto, or into Esperanto, completing the work in March 1915, as we stated. However, Zamenhof was prevented from sending the completed manuscript to the Bible Committee in Great Britain, informing the committee's president, Esperantist, Reverend John Cyprian Rust, one of our New Testament translators, of the major obstacle which had arisen. Writing in French, which was permitted by postal censorship rules, Zamenhof wrote, Unfortunately, I cannot at the present time send you the translation because our postal service does not forward anything which is written in Esperanto. Therefore, I must wait until the end of the war. End quote. Only after the First World War, it says, and two years after the death of Zamenhof, did the translation finally arrive in Britain? So uh, the British clergy with the British and Foreign Bible Society get Zamenhof's translation and they marry it to their translation of the New Testament and the result is the Londona Biblio, which we'll talk about now. I'm going to read this part of the article. From 1919 until 1926, the Bible Committee read through and corrected the text harmonizing the language of the New Testament to the Old. Okay. Um, and typeset and proofread it. Two Quakers, the sisters, Priscilla Hanover, Hannah Peckover, Priscilla Hannah Peckover, and Algerina Peckover, the Peckover sisters, supported the project financially. A translation of the entire Christian canon as recognized by Protestants, often referred to in Esperanto as the Londona Biblio, was published in 1926. Within five years, more than 5,000 copies of the Esperanto Bible had sold. In English, you only sell 5,000 copies. Not good. In Esperanto, rousing success. Now, as I mentioned... In my copy here, it's not just the New Testament and the Old Testament, but also the Apocrypha, or as the Orthodox and Catholics would call it, the Deuterocanon, the second canon. Little section here about that. By 2001, it says, Garrett Berveling, who was a, he's a master of ancient languages. I believe that he knows Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, maybe some others. But he has translated a number of ancient uh, texts into Esperanto from their original languages. 
By 2001, Garrett Berveling had also translated to Esperanto and published three volumes of the Deuterocanonical books, or as Protestants would call it, the Apocrypha. Texts from the first two volumes, as used in the Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Lutheran churches, were incorporated into an edition of the Esperanto Bible published two years later. And that, that edition, is what, is what I have. That's what we've got here. So it's got the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Apocrypha. Okay. Now, um, why does it have the Apocrypha? I know perhaps some Protestants out there are asking that question. Not used to seeing it uh, in Bibles. There's a few reasons for that. For one, we should keep in mind that the earliest editions of Protestant Bibles... The Geneva Bible, for instance, the King James Version, the earliest uh, printings, had the Apocrypha. Martin Luther himself, Mr. Reformation, said that the Apocryphal books are not to be seen as on the same level as Holy Scripture, but that they are good to read. They're good and useful to read. Okay, so even the early reformers did not quite have the attitude toward the Apocrypha that many Protestants do today. I've read some of the books. I think they're interesting. I don't think that we should view them as scripture, but I don't mind them being in the Bible. Okay, or within, we'll say this, I don't mind them being in, in the same, in between the same covers as the biblical books. Okay, the other reason, too, is that the Esperanto community is small, the Christian community is even smaller, and so there just naturally has to be some cooperation between the Catholics, the Protestants, and the Orthodox. And in this case, because there is only one Esperanto translation of the Bible, you know, it's one translation to rule them all. You know, it's kind of got to serve every branch of the community. Speaking of that, there was an attempt, I know, later on to, um, to create a new translation of the Esperanto Bible. There were some who thought that this edition was a little too literal, perhaps a little too wooden. Um, and they wanted, I think, to create something that was kind of the, the Esperanto equivalent of the NIV. It was never completed, though. Garrett Berveling, who we discussed, did the Deuterocanonical books or the Apocrypha, whatever you want to call it. He did do, I know, at least the book of Numbers, I believe, and maybe some other Old Testament books, and many of the New Testament books, though I don't know that he actually completed the New Testament, and that work was eventually published. But there's not another complete edition of the Bible beyond this one in Esperanto. As, as I've stated, one translation to rule them all. Maybe one day we'll get something, I don't know, but, but for now, this is it. It's not like English where you have 95 different choices. But anyway, that's an overview. Uh, I hope that that was interesting for you. We'll go ahead and crack this thing open. Like I said, it's not ornate. Um, there's nothing, uh, uh, you know, special about the actual printing itself. Uh, but we'll give it a look and see what's in between these two covers here. The volume, first of all, is well constructed. Uh, it doesn't feel cheap or eager to fall apart just because you decide to read it. As we look on the title page here, it tells us that the Old Testament was translated by L. L. Zamenhof, the Deuterocanonical books by Garrett Berveling, and the New Testament by the British Committee, Brito Comitado, along with the names of the three men that we previously discussed. If we turn the page, uh, here at the top we read the Old Testament with the Deuterocanonical books, and then the name Genezo, which is Genesis. And it also says here, La Unua Libro de Moseo, or the first book of Moses. If we read the first verse here, we read, In la comenzo dio creis la cielon kai la teron. That translates quite literally into some words that are likely very familiar to many people watching this video, which is, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth.
Now, if we flip through here, then we'll see that it's just the Bible. Nothing ornate, just the text itself, just the biblical text. And here in the back, we find the table of contents. Old Testament at the top with the Apocrypha mixed in, and the New Testament at the bottom. Um, I believe there's a note in here, uh, right here actually in the lower left-hand corner, um, which tells us that the order of the books in the Old Testament, that it follows the order in the Latin Vulgate. Now, if we go here to page 1194, we find the first page of the Gospel of John, or as it says at the top, La Evangelio la Johanna. That just simply means the Gospel according to John, is actually literal translation. And reading the first line, we read, In la comenzo estis la vorto, cae la vorto estis cundio, cae la vorto estis dio. Or the very well-known words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And lastly, if we jump over here to page 768, we actually find one of the apocryphal books, La Sagezzo de Salomono, or The Wisdom of Solomon. And we'll see it labeled uh, under the title as a deuterocanonical book. The first verse here reads, Amo justetson, vi cui iugis lateron, penso pri la signoro con bonezzo, cae con sincerezzo sed julin. And that translates as love justice, or justetso could be translated like righteousness. It could be righteousness or justice. But love justice, you who judge the earth, Think about the Lord with goodness and search for him with sincerity. And that's it. Uh, that is my copy of the Holy Bible in Esperanto. All right, guys, that's it. I hope you found it interesting, the Esperanto translation of the Bible. Um, you know, what I would like to do is I would like to eventually see this Bible be printed, you know, the text be printed. Um, in a way that's a little more uh, beautiful, you know, a truly beautiful deluxe luxury edition of the Bible and Esperanto. Another thing that I would like to see would one day be an Esperanto study Bible. The issue there is just simply that, the, as we discussed earlier, the Christian community in, in Esperanto is already small. When you're talking about study Bibles and, and making theological statements, Obviously, the same Bible that can serve Catholics is not going to serve Baptists. The same Bible that's not going to serve Orthodox, not going to serve Catholics. Not going to serve Pentecostals, you know. Um, so, in order, so there's no real way to create one study Bible that's going to be satisfactory for all communities. Um, but still, uh, I would one day like to see that. That's kind of a dream and a vision that's been placed on my heart. And... Perhaps eventually it'll come to fruition. Um, but that's it for now. You know, as I said, I hope you found it interesting. Check out some of the resources I linked to in the description. Uh, if anything I've said about Esperanto has intrigued you, then I would highly encourage you to go ahead and follow that impulse and go learn some Esperanto. But for now, uh, we'll see you later and talk to you another time.